All right, hallelujah. Okay, we are in section three, I believe, is where we stopped. Message before the ministry. Lots of times I get uh, uh, people, a request for people asking me to pray for them. Sometimes their circumstances are that they can't sit through a meeting uh, because they're in pain or, or they're just too sick to do it. And uh, many times, though, occasionally you run into some uh, situation where someone just doesn't want to sit through the meeting. You know, they uh, just want prayer. And they are of the opinion uh, that somehow or another it is prayer that gets people healed. But I want, to, want you to notice, if you haven't noticed this, when you look through the scriptures, we don't see Jesus praying for the sick. The word prayer and, and healing are not connected in the, in the Gospels. Now, the, uh, the book of James does connect them. It says the prayer of faith will raise up the sick, that will heal the sick. So, but it's the prayer of faith. Now, so what, what people are trying to do sometimes is trying to uh, see this thing in a different way than I see it. Uh, they have a paradigm of that somehow or another there's a powerful prayer or a powerful prayer that really gets the work done. And, and there have been paradigms like that in many cases in the past. But when we see the New Testament, what we see is that Jesus heals the vast majority of the people in the Gospels. He heals them in the context of the gospel. In other words, he has preached the gospel of the kingdom to them and they have come. Now, so one of the things we want to do is increase the potential for healing by doing that. Let me give you a, a couple illustrations about how this works for me. Someone calls me, and this is a true story, someone called me, a pastor called me, asked me to go across town to pray for a lady in his church who had uh, developed, uh, she had gotten very ill with liver cancer mid-30s and she had become unconscious, uh, was not expected to live very much longer. My wife is a registered nurse and tells me that when someone's kidneys have ceased functioning, um, then typically they're going to pass within 72 hours. And this has happened, this lady's kidneys are not functioning, she's in the intensive ward, intensive care ward. So I arrived there and um, I spend a few moments, she's unconscious by the way, and so I spend a few moments speaking the good news over her. Something like this, uh, the reason I know that the Lord wants you well is that he healed everyone in the multitudes. He never turned anyone away, never suggested someone was too, too sick, too sinful, too whatever in order to heal. He, he ministered healing to all who would come, and I know that if you were able to come to Jesus in the multitudes, he'd heal you. Beyond that, he heals you because he bore our pain, carried our sorrows by his stripes, you're healed. The cross is enough as far as God is concerned. If God is satisfied with what Jesus has done at the cross for you, and therefore this is a matter of grace. God will heal you because he loves you, and he'll give you the gift of healing. I just speak the good news over her. Now, why am I doing this? Well, um, perhaps I'm not having a good day. Uh, you know, somebody says, well, maybe she hears it, maybe she doesn't. But I'm not doing it necessarily for her sake. I'm doing it for my sake in order to get myself into the right inner chemistry for healing. So I'm focusing on her, uh, focusing on Jesus by giving the gospel and I'm putting it into the context of the good news and it changes my own inner chemistry. Maybe I'm not having a good day. My wife and I, uh, by the way, celebrated our 42nd anniversary this, this month. How about that, huh? Yep. Yep. And uh, we have never considered divorce for our once in a while marital problems. Murder, but never divorce. <laughs> and uh, in any case, uh, <laughs> the bottom line is that we don't always get along, even though we work it out, okay? We've always uh, had a tendency to, you know, to work through things, but there have been moments where things have not been good between us. So perhaps I'm experiencing one of those days when she and I have not seen eye to eye on something. She's a strong-willed lady and I'm fairly strong-willed myself. And so, but we work at getting along. But uh, in any case, maybe we're not getting along, so I walk out of the house and my focus is on the fact that we have had a squabble that today. Not feeling very good. And perhaps I'm dressed like Benny Hinn. I have white shoes on and a white suit, you know, and, and I have this really bad flat tire on the way to the hospital. And so I get out to change the flat tire and pretty soon I'm looking pretty grubby, you know. The white suit is all, I don't wear white suits, but you know, I'm illustrating. Um, 
but in any case, uh, things had gotten pretty dirty. And by the time I reached the hospital, my focus is anything but spiritual. But I can change that. I can get myself back into the right spiritual condition by focusing my attention on Jesus by the good news. By speaking the good news over her, I'm no longer concerned about the fact that I'm dirty. No longer concerned about the fact that my wife and I are getting along. It's all about Jesus and not about Roger in a negative way. You, get the, you see what I'm saying? So I get the right inner chemistry so that when I did pray for this woman, um, what happened was a little electricity flowed. Uh, I felt a little tingling, uh, like touching your tongue to a dry cell. They tell me men know what I'm talking about, but the ladies don't. Um, <laughs> um, it's not a phenomenon that women do very often, apparently, is touch their tongue to a dry cell, but the guys do. And uh, in any case, um, she, uh, her kidneys start functioning during the night. Uh, she uh, becomes conscious by morning. Within a few days of that time, they determine she doesn't have any cancer anymore. So it's that simple. So getting the right chemistry by using the good news really changes the events. And so we encourage people to take a moment, instead of just praying in those circumstances. Um, since I've been here, I, I prayed with a minister of the gospel who was uh, dealing with a cancer situation. And uh, what I did was I started the conversation with him basically this way. I know you already understand about the good news, but I'm going to share the good news for not just for your sake, but for my sake. So, so I put it into the context of when we pray for you, it's all about what Jesus has done and not about who Roger is. And um, in any case, I did that and we prayed and I felt like something happened when it happened. And I do that consistently with just about everyone. Even on the telephone, I will do that. Um, I had a, had a lady friend call me and ask me if I would pray for one of her friends. It was a healing evangelist who had developed liver cancer. I guess, I guess another situation, it was just cancer. I don't know if it was liver cancer. In any case, he um, was in hospice care and um, I, I got him on the telephone and told him basically, I know that you already know this, but I want to put it into the right context. I want to talk to you about Jesus just for a moment. He said, no problem, brother, just go right ahead. So I shared with him why I believe the Lord would heal him and uh, then prayed with him over the telephone. He got hot. Uh, this, I found out this two weeks later. Uh, after I hung up, he got hot. He stayed hot for three days. The nurses thought that he had developed a fever and tried to get his fever down, but it was really healing happening with him. And by the end of the three days, he didn't have cancer any longer. And so we've seen that kind of phenomenon. But I'm convinced that putting into the context of what Jesus has done by sharing the good news, even just a little bit about it, even while you're praying perhaps, makes a, makes a big difference makes a big difference on your own inner chemistry when you're praying. You know that it's all about Jesus and not about you having a good day. And so, you know, we get people, I get people, I see people healed some days when I don't feel very good, you know, and, and some days when I feel really spiritual. Um, we always say it this way. On weeks that I've had lots of time to pray and be spiritual and read, my, read the scriptures and, do, and fast and pray and do all those kinds of spiritual things, we get about 85% of the people we pray for seem to receive a healing. When I'm really having a hard week, things are tough and I haven't had time to pray and maybe things are not going well in different ways, uh, we get about 85% of the people we pray for heal. It's, Roger is off the roller coaster. The roller coaster of my own righteousness was a bad place to live because going up and down because of I, you know, feeling spiritual one day and not feeling spiritual the other days and thinking that somehow that mattered much is really not a good place to live. I'm off the roller coaster of my own righteousness. Healing happens because of what Jesus has done, not because of what Roger's doing. Everybody get this? And so it's very important not only for me to be off the roller coaster, but for you to be off the roller coaster too. Get off the roller coaster of your own righteousness. God isn't gonna heal people because you feel righteous. He isn't going to withhold healing from people because you don't feel righteous. It's all about what Jesus has done. All about what Jesus has done. Christ-centered message is good news. Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. That's the pattern of Jesus' ministry. Uh, when we talk about what Jesus accomplished at the cross, John 19, verse 30, it says, he said, it is finished. Now this, is a, this Greek phrase is pretty powerful. 
uh, is the word translated here as finish is a Greek word for perfect. And uh, it uh, is also in the perfect tense. So it really could be translated more literally as it is perfectly perfect. That's what Jesus said at the cross. Now, from God's perspective, what does that mean? That means from God's perspective, what Jesus has done at the cross, God is completely, God the Father is completely satisfied with that. Everybody say satisfied. Satisfied. See, the problem is, is that we're not. God's satisfied with it, but we're not. And so we have a tendency to allow people to add conditions to that and various different things. And we think that somehow or another our righteousness plays a part of that. So we work to cross every T and dot every I. We work to sometimes clean up our filthy rags. And when we really work hard at cleaning them up, we may get them a little cleaner. But what do we have then? We have clean rags. They're still rags, still unacceptable to God. Um, And the bottom line is that that effort to do that gets in the way of receiving grace from God. We really just need to receive it uh, on the basis of just as I am without one plea. And when we do that, we're able to receive healing completely uh, from the Lord. The Greek word uh, could be translated as also the word complete or finished as, as is normally translated in a traditional way. So the phrase would be perfectly perfect, completely perfect, perfectly complete, perfectly finished, finished com- perfectly, <laughs> completely finished or finished completely. So you get the idea here that this phrase that Jesus uttered at the cross uh, really means far as God is concerned, the work is done. The work is done. Nothing to add to this, nothing to take away from it. it is, God is satisfied with it. And so on the basis of the cross, God is satisfied with us. We can't add our own righteousness to that. That's why we can get witches healed. On one occasion, I actually got a Satanist healed. He was showing off most Satanists I've encountered over the years are the, ch- the offended children of Christians. You say it again? Most Satanists that I have encountered over the years, even guys in prison, are the offended children of Christians. And the Satanist thing is strictly, they're still doing adolescent rebellion. They're still trying to offend their parents. And on, on occasion, I've been able to get parents on the phone with their Satanist son and explain to them before their son gets on there that I think that if they would apologize, ask forgiveness, that their Satanist son might not be a Satanist anymore, that he would drop the Satanist thing, that they shouldn't say anything to him about it, just let it go, but ask his forgiveness. You know, it's so sad sometimes the self-righteousness of Christian parents will come out. They will, they're unable to ask forgiveness of their offended child. So sad. You see that sometimes. I hope that you're able to humble yourself with your kids and ask forgiveness when it's necessary for you to do that. Because your kids may see things completely different than you do. And if you can justify all your actions, well, goodness gracious, I have never met a perfect parent yet. (laughs) Anyway, moving right along here. Bottom of page six. Christ reveals the Father's view of sickness. Now, we've already talked about this verse. This is a very powerful verse. Anybody who ministers healing really ought to know this verse backwards and forwards and understand the implications of it. Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is the, uh, good to those who ask him? And the phrase here, much more, is a comparison. Jesus is inviting us to compare what we would do as earthly parents, imperfect earthly parents, uh, with what the Heavenly Father will do. So he is taking the mystery out of this. Jesus is taking the mystery out of what will, God will do. If you would do it for your kids, being an imperfect parent, then the, here's the, Jesus says that God the Father will do much more. It's really an interesting measure. So if you would not give your children cancer, what is God the Father not doing? Not giving you cancer. If you are, do everything in your power to heal your child of cancer, then what is God the Father doing? Doing everything in his power. He has. He sent his son to be your healer. He's done more than, he's done much more than you would do. He's sent his son to die on the cross so that you, so that you could receive your healing. So what we see is this, this way of comparing things enables us to determine what God is willing to do. And it, op- it opens the door for a lot of things. Teaching on this particular thing, talking about, you know, a son losing his hair, that illustration I gave you when we first started, 
Um, I, I had a woman respond to this, and she said uh, she had a birthmark on the side of her neck, kind of a discoloration on the side of her neck. It wasn't real obvious, but uh, when she pointed it out, I could see what she was talking about. She said, if God is, if I'm willing to do, if I had a daughter who had a birthmark and it was within my power to remove that birthmark, um, you're saying that God is willing to do much more than I'm willing to do? I said, yes. I said, would you be willing to, for your daughter to remove it from your daughter's situation? She said, of course. And I said, okay, then God's willing to do it for you as well. So we prayed with her. And I, if I remember correctly, the email she sent me, she said it had disappeared slowly over six weeks, completely disappeared. So, so God is willing to do even things that we might consider to be cosmetic because we're willing to do those cosmetic things for our children. See how this opens the door for grace in other areas that we would not think about, perhaps? If we're willing to do it for our children, then God the Father is willing to do it for us. Uh, if you had a son or daughter who was in serious debt and was in your power, you had great riches. Anybody, that describe anybody in this room? You have great riches in Christ. Uh, you have a, a heavenly father that has great riches naturally too. If it was within your power to help your son or daughter with that very serious debt that they have, would you do it? Come on. Yeah, sure you would. Because debt becomes a crippling kind of thing. It doesn't really matter to us at some point how they got there. If they were in that circumstance and couldn't get out, wouldn't you help them? See, see that's... So all of a sudden we see that uh, this particular thing that Jesus has said opens the door for many things in the area of the grace of God. God willing to do many things for us. This is Luke's gospel, chapter 14, verse 5. is another one of those kinds of statements that we can understand something about healing well. Which one of you shall have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? Now this, of course, the issue here with us is not about the Sabbath. But here Jesus, in doing a healing, he healed a man of something that's called dropsy. We don't know exactly what dropsy is today. It's been speculated that it was edema because the Greek word for dropsy has the word hydro in it. It's a compound word that has the word hydro in it, which Greek word for water. So it's thought to be edema, which uh, is the expansion of the tissues with too much water. Edema can be a life-threatening condition under certain circumstances. Uh, someone's leg or arm or wherever they have edema could, you know, get three or four times its normal size, and it becomes very dangerous, obviously, to the person. So here this man had edema, perhaps, and uh, the Pharisees was setting Jesus up in this circumstance to heal him on the Sabbath day, and Jesus responds this way. Which one of you shall have a son or an ox fall into a well one will not immediately put him out on the Sabbath day? What is Jesus describing this man's condition? This man's condition is like, from God's perspective, like a child falling into a well. So this is, uh, you know, we sometimes people have put healing, uh, excuse me, put, um, um, you know, sickness into other categories as a teaching or something of that nature, God using it as a teaching. But here Jesus describes it as falling into a well. And what's a well like? Well, it's a damp, dark place trying to climb out. Um, could be very difficult. The sides are slippery. I fall back in. That's the experience of many people with sickness. Uh, they have a condition uh, that interferes with their life in so many ways, and they are in a dark place because of it. And they have tried to climb out. They've done everything humanly possible to get out of the well, and they keep falling in. The treatments that they have, perhaps for whatever they're dealing with, they themselves are problematic and have weakened them, so they really are living in a dark place. How many of you, do you remember a, a girl named, what was that girl's name that fell into the well in Texas, TD? Jessica, thank you. you? I should know that, she knows it back there. I'm te <laughs> Jessica fell into a well in Texas, do you remember that? Uh, it was probably 20 years ago, wasn't it? Um, I was in the Army at the time, an Army officer, and uh, the Army, interestingly enough, nearly shut down because of it. Everybody was focused on the television. We opened the chapels up for prayer. People came to the chapels to pray for Jessica. I understand that people got on, who were experts in drilling and extraction and various different things, got on airplanes all over the North American continent and came to Texas without being invited 
to help get this girl out of the well. And hearts just went out to her. I mean, people were praying, I suspect, worldwide for Jessica. And they did get her out of the well. In fact, she is an adult now and has appeared on some television programs about her circumstance there. But in any case, uh, if our hearts go out that way, here Jesus is saying this is how God the Father responds. He responds to us when we're sick as if we've fallen into a well. And once, of course, Christ is going to extract us. Okay? So if you're in a well today, believe me, Jesus intends for you to be out of that well. He intends for you to be extracted. What father wouldn't immediately respond to get his child out of the well in that circumstance? That's the picture Jesus gives us of healing. It's an extraction from a well. That wonderful picture of what it's supposed to be like, it's a rescue. Jesus is rescuing you. The Greek word sozo for salvation also includes the idea of being rescued. And here is a rescue from a well. It's Faith in Christ um, comes from hearing the good news about Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, it says, How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear it without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So this is how it works. The faithful word about Christ comes to us via a preacher. We believe what the preacher says about Jesus as he's being presented, and we're able to receive what Jesus has done for us. It's really that simple. We've made this thing fairly complex. We've given lots of rules and regulations, but when someone hears the good news, and um, this became evident to me that uh, we in the Western world have a more complex response to the, the good news than they do, in, say, in the Far East. when. Um, uh, I used to hear about this when I was a younger believer and uh, about our preachers would go to India or China and they'd come back with these amazing stories of all the miracles that they had seen. And, uh, and then in their own churches, nothing's happening. <laughs> and it was really puzzling. It was really puzzling that uh, that was happening that way. And uh, I don't know that they even got it sometimes, but I did. I, I thought, why is it happening there, but it's not happening here? It always puzzled me. But I think that there was two reasons. Number one, I believe that when they went to India, they preached about Jesus. When they came back to their churches, they taught the Bible. There's a difference. There is a difference. You can teach the Bible and leave Jesus out completely. You can, and it, what you see is the miraculous in the scriptures connected with the good news about Jesus. And I think the second thing is, is that the people here in the western part of the church, we have a complex response to the gospel. We say, yes, but. Yes, yes, Jesus just wants to heal us, but. Then we bring in all the reasons why there may be a reason why we're not supposed to be healed. You know, are we all the discouragements that we've had over the years? Quite frankly, I run into people that are highly discouraged about healing because they've had so many people pray for them. And they think that they've done everything. Uh, and that particular attitude, of course, you're going to run into some problems receiving a healing. I was. Uh, ministering in a Canadian church, and there was a woman in that church who uh, I had done some healing up on the stage. We had had a very interesting, uh, what shall I say, it was a very uh, illustrative type of healing. There was a woman who responded to the gospel, and I was doing a demonstration, and she had to be in probably her 80s, and uh, she had arthritis pretty badly, and when I brought, when she came up on stage, she couldn't lift her leg uh, up enough to get up on the stage. She actually had to have some help. Uh, getting up to where they, where they wanted me to stand. They were, had a certain area of the stage lit because they were videotaping everything. So I had, uh, they wanted me to do it there, so she had to come to me. So in any case, uh, she gets up there and I interview her and she does have very bad arthritis, can't lift her arms without severe pain, hardly can walk. And uh, so anyway, I minister to her after you know, she's heard the good news and minister to her and, and she gets healed. She's moving, all, moving around, bending, touching her toes, doing all sorts of things. And I say, now that you're healed, what are you going to do with this? She says, well, I'm going to dance. And I said, uh, I said, dance before the Lord, being a spiritual guy that I am. And she said, oh, no, ballroom dancing. And I said, I, the pastor and I got the same idea at the same time. You know how that works? You know, you look at somebody, you know you're thinking the same thing. I looked at him. And he looked back at me, we both smiled, and I said, sir, I said, ma'am, is your husband here? And yes, would, you, would he like to dance with you? Oh, yes. 
So he came up on stage, the keyboard guy came up and he started playing something. The two of them started dancing up there on the stage and the whole church just cheered. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those moments, you know, you, you get to see those moments every so often. It was one of those real moments. And uh, anyway, later in the evening, I'm down praying with people and I meet this young woman and she's got arthritis, uh, probably mid thirties. And uh, she is as bad as, I mean, she's really in worse shape than the other lady. I mean, she, they're telling her she's going to be in a, uh, a wheelchair. Her fingers are deformed, you know. She's just really in bad shape from the arthritis. And so I, uh, I, uh, I laid hands on her and started praying with her and get her to do this little confession that we do. This healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. And she starts it and she says, this healing belongs. And I, wait a minute, hold on. I said, I said, uh, are you frustrated about this healing thing? She said, oh, yes. I said, well, why are you frustrated? She says, and she starts naming apparently uh, important Canadian ministers, okay, which I don't know. But in uh, any case, they prayed for her and she didn't receive anybody, anything. And so I know now that if, if I don't change the situation, she's just going to put me on her list <laughs> of all the people that prayed for her. And so I said, have you ever seen anyone healed on stage like you saw tonight? Well, no. I said, have you ever heard anybody preach the gospel about healing the way that I did, that it already belongs to you, that Father's willing for you to receive, and so on? Well, no. I said, so the circumstance is different, but you're reacting to it as if it's the same. I said, could you just for a moment pretend that no one else has ever prayed for you? Could you just start fresh? And she said, well, I, she did that. She chuckled and she said, well, I guess I could. She said, can you just postpone your disbelief? <laughs> can you just believe with me for a few minutes, you know, that this is going to be a different circumstance? And she agreed to that. And so I laid hands on her and got her to do the confession. This healing belongs to me. And it came out differently. She had a different attitude. And she was able to receive her healing. She was completely healed on the spot. We even watched her hands that were so deformed just go back to normal pretty quickly. So, you know, it, sometimes people have, you know, they get into a place where they're frustrated and, you know, and then they, they say, yes, Jesus heals, but I'm the special exception. You know, everybody else can get healed, but I just can't get healed. Turn to somebody and say, you're not that special. <laughs> you're not that special that God would leave you out of his plan. But that's a very common way to respond, and it's called doubt. It's how doubt works, and we're going to get into that in just a few minutes here. But what I want you to do is I want you to respond in a simple way, like the multitudes to Jesus. They saw him healing the sick. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They came to him with expectation that they had received healing, and guess what happened? They received healing. And that's what happens when you go to countries that have not been programmed with doubt you see that people just respond in a simple way. You bring the gospel to them and they just come and they get healed. And so the miracles and signs and wonders are common in those kinds of cultures where people respond in that very, very simple way. Uh, back a few years ago, my son was living with me and I got to know my grandson pretty well. And uh, he would, uh, he'd be waiting for me when I came in from a meeting. Most of the, most of the meetings that I do are in the US and Canada. Uh, I do occasionally go someplace else, but uh, that's where I spend a lot of my time. And so he'd be waiting for me typically on a late, late Sunday evening, and I'd come in, and, and uh, his name is Benjamin, and he'd be sitting on the stairs right in front of our front door, and he would stand up, and he would bend over, and he'd say, Granddaddy, did you bring me a surprise? <laughs> and I said, Yes, Benjamin, I do have a surprise for you. Now what had happened was, is I'd created this expectation by, in the spur of the moment, uh, while I was in an airport, headed home, I saw a toy hanging on a, you know, a rack in one of the shops, and I decided, hey, that'd be nice, I'll just pick him up a toy. And then I created this expectation that every time I was gone and was kind of returning, that I was going to bring him a surprise. And uh, it's interesting, um, my wife, uh, you know, picking up on this, being a smart lady, uh, recognizing that toys in airports were pretty expensive, um, that she went out to, to Toys R Us and bought quite a few small things so that I'd always have something for Benjamin when I came in the door. And uh, in any case, uh, my son, interestingly enough, spoiled this. Uh, he didn't intend to, it was, it, there was no intent in this, but he 
saw Benjamin respond that way to me, you know, bending over and waiting for the big eyes, you know, did you bring me a surprise? And uh, he said something to Benjamin one day that made it more complex for him. He said, Benjamin, you ought to at least say hello to granddaddy before you ask for something. Now that sounds really innocent, doesn't it? But it made it more complex to him. In his head now, from something, he, something, the way that my son said this to him, made him think that there was something wrong in what he was doing. And he never did it again. It created complexity in his thinking about it. And see, this simple response of receiving what Jesus has provided for you shouldn't be complex. God loves you, sent his son to die for you, wants you to have healing. Simple. Wants you to be healed. See? Simple. It's not any more complex than that. And yet it's, we've got all this yes, but going on in our head. Complexities. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to spend a few moments here. This is section four. Multitudes model the proper response. Okay? Faith in Christ is the product of the real gospel. The good news. So if we're bringing the good news to people, how are they supposed to respond? We want them to respond like the multitudes did. That's the model of response. To just come and expect Jesus to help them. So um, this is the top of page eight. Um, the woman with the issue of blood is a, dim, is a good place to look at. Matthew chapter 9, verse 22. Here Jesus says to her after she receives the healing, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And at once the woman was made well. Now what did this woman do that Jesus is describing as faith? Well, she came with expectation. She made a decision that she was going to receive a healing. She was not double-minded about it. She actually overcame some things in the culture. You did not, apparently a woman did not approach a rabbi in this culture. And uh, as a result, you know, she had to overcome this thing in the culture. She was also, a, also, excuse me, she was also unclean under the law of Moses. And uh, she shouldn't have even been in the crowd at all. And certainly shouldn't have touched a rabbi being in an unclean condition. And yet she had to overcome all that in order to do what she did. But Jesus said nothing to her about her failure to keep the law of Moses. He only commended her for her faith. Isn't this good news? See, he said to her, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. What was her faith? She overcame these things. She came to Jesus expecting to be helped by him. She didn't expect it to be rebuked by him, interestingly enough, or she probably wouldn't have come. She saw grace there, didn't she? And you need to see grace in Jesus too. Yeah, that he will not turn you away. You can come to him with expectation that he's going to help you. That passage of scripture we first talked about when we first started this thing. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. What is Jesus saying? He's saying I'm completely approachable. You won't get, you won't get hurt by coming to me. He's completely approachable, only wants to help, and that's what he does. He, for those who come to him, he helps them. He only had bad things to say about the, the Pharisees <laughs> who wouldn't come, who were you know, relying upon their own self-righteousness. He didn't say anything bad about those who were struggling with sin. Is this good news? He'll help you with that too. If you struggle with sin, hey, join the club. Because there's a lot of folks over the years that have found victory in Christ, but they were struggling beforehand. Everybody hear that? People find victory in Christ, but they all struggle before then. Okay, so if you're struggling, you're doing the right thing. You'll find victory in Christ. Come on, come on. This good news? He doesn't turn you away because you're struggling. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He only wants to help you. Is that good news? Yes. Two blind men, Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, and he touched their eyes and saying, be it done to you according to your faith. What did these men do that Jesus is describing as faith? They persisted and overcame difficulties to come to Christ for healing. The Canaanite woman's daughter, we mentioned her before. Matthew chapter 15, O woman, your faith is great. Be it done to you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. What action on the part of this woman does Jesus describe as faith? 
She came to Christ for help for her daughter and would not give up. See, sometimes people worry about whether they've got enough faith. What does faith do? In the New Testament, faith comes to Christ for help. That's what faith does. Faith is not something you feel. It's something that causes you, that motivates you to come to Christ. It's believing in Him. It's not some strength that you have. It's really seeing Him as your strength. It's something that occurs outside. In fact, one of the things that's interesting, you do the kind of ministry that I do regularly, you hear a lot of different things, and you begin to realize what people are actually saying. When people say, I have faith, they're not talking about real faith. They're talking about something else. Because if they had real faith, they would talk about Jesus, not about their faith. Faith always has some, some object outside of itself, so faith doesn't talk about itself. It talks about the object. I, it's like saying, I love. Well, okay, but who? Who do you love? Well, I love my wife. Then well, if I love my wife, what do I do? I don't talk about my love. I talk about my wife. Do you get this? <laughs> Most time when people are talking about their faith, what they're actually talking about is intellectual assent to the facts of the gospel. Intellectual assent that God heals the sick. Intellectual assent that God is healing. That is a very different matter than having personal faith in Christ as your healer. It's very different than coming to him. So, and one thing you receive healing, the other thing you don't necessarily. The, the entire church, uh, well, with, well, there are a few exceptions, but the, most of the church does believe that theoretically that Jesus heals the sick. That's intellectual assent. That is not faith in Christ. They're very different. But to get the difference? I hope so. All right, moving right along. Four men's faith, Mark chapter 2, verse 5. Seeing their faith, he said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. Here is a case where four men overcame the obstacles of getting their friend to Jesus. Remember the story, the house was full of people. They tried to get their, son, uh, the, they tried to get their friend in to see Jesus. Uh, they can't get in the door with their friend. Now, in at least American culture, what would happen there for most Christians, they would have given up. That's the truth. They would have given up. They would assume because the circumstances are not correct, this must mean it's not God's will. They would have used the circumstances to determine the will of God. But here these men don't do that. Instead, what do they do? They go to the roof of the house. Uh, not entirely clear how this happens, but they get their friend into the presence of Jesus. Lower their friend into his presence. And the scripture says, and seeing their faith. Not seeing their friend's faith, but seeing their faith. Can you believe for someone else? Yeah. Yeah, we t I, in my, my, one of my books over there, I talk about it as hopeful neutrality. You can get people who have hopeful neutrality about it. They'll let you pray for them. They may be nice if I'm healed, but they're not really actively believing for themselves. I've seen, I've seen that over the years. I was in New Zealand and uh, ministering in a youth church that was part of a larger work um, in uh, the, the capital city. Um, what's the name of the capital city? Uh, I'm blank. I'll think of it in a second. Uh, in any case, I was ministering. There. It was a fairly large church and had a large youth group, 300 kids. In fact, they had satellite youth groups all over New Zealand. Um, youth group is probably a poor description. They were, in order to be in the youth church, you had to be 15 years old up to 25. The leadership of the, the group was 25. And once they hit 26, they had to go to the larger adult work. Even the leadership was, uh, was young. In any case, the, the overall pastor of the group, he set this thing up and he says, Roger, keep your message short. Not easy for me to do. Um, keep your message short and just do the stuff. You know, get, do some demonstrations with the, the kids. They'll really like to see people heal. So I, I said, okay, uh, I can do that, I think. In any case, I got to the place where I'd preached the shortest message in history and, uh, and then uh, and invited some kid, one of the kids who had a bad back or a bad shoulder, bad knees or something to come up for prayer. Nobody responds. So understanding my Texas English is a little different than uh, New Zealand English. So I make the plea a little more deliberate this time, more, more careful. Nobody still comes. And finally, I do it a third time. And finally, this kid swaggers up to the front. And by his body language, I can tell he's showing off for his friends. 
And, but he does have a bad back. Uh, if you hadn't been to New Zealand, New Zealand is uh, like England, in many respects culturally, uh, except with surfing. Lots of, lots of boating, surfing, that sort of thing. And this kid has had some sort of surfing mishap where he's hurt his back. And uh, he can't bend over, so I lay him a hands on this kid and get him to do the confession. This healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. And pretty soon I feel a little heat happening. I ask him if he feels it, and he's not sure. But I said, well, go ahead and try bending. Well, this time he goes all the way down. He touches his toes, and he comes up, and he has this very surprised look on his face. And he says the S word really loud. <laughs> curses. He curses. <laughs> well, I start laughing. The whole church is laughing because it, clearly he's very surprised at this. So I say to him, I say, well, try it again. And so he goes all the way down and puts his palms on the floor this time, comes up, and he still has this really funny look on his face, and he says the S word all over again. And so we're all just laughing, and then all of a sudden the, the look on this kid's face changes. And he, look, he has stark terror. He's afraid of me, and he starts backpedaling away from me. And uh, he jumps off the stage and runs out of the church with a whole bunch of kids chasing him. And they, they finally tackle him, apparently, <laughs> and lead him to Jesus somewhere in the process. Where he receives Christ as his Savior. And the next day, I'm having lunch with the pastor. And uh, he says, you know, we got calls from all over New Zealand about that healing, Roger. I said, really? How did people find out about it? He said, you didn't realize that we were broadcasting that live last night? <laughs> And the reason people believed it is because the kid cursed. <laughs> they knew it wasn't a setup because it wasn't religious. <laughs> so sometimes you can surprise people, you know, with healing in that kind of way. And uh, we do believe that it's important for them to come to a place of faith. So make sure that we give them the gospel along with it so that they have a, have a, you know, they know how they received healing and so that they can believe. Quite often we've led people to Christ during that particular thing. I think that's what happened to that kid. He was, a bit, he was a guest with someone else. He heard me make the offer. He came up to kind of show off. He got healed in the process and then he became a believer shortly after that. That's, that's, that's the way it should happen, isn't it? That's right. Uh, four men's place. So uh, the point I was making is that we can believe for other people um, that maybe we're not quite there yet, but we encourage you to bring the good news to that circumstance so they have an opportunity to believe there too. Top of page nine, blind Bartimaeus was healed. Mark chapter 10, in that passage, Jesus says, go your way, your faith has made you well, and immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. In that circumstance, we know the story, uh, Jesus was passing through Jericho, um, he was apparently the crowd around him was making a great deal of noise. Uh, this blind man heard the noise, asked what was happening. They told him that the prophet Jesus was passing through. He began to cry out, son of David, have mercy on me. Interestingly enough, it's the very same thing that two years prior to this event that the other blind men had done. They had cried out to Jesus in the same sort of way. Um, these stories, I suspect, got around Israel. Uh, and so probably people said, well, that's how you receive healing. We know that the story of the woman with the issue of blood was well known in Jesus' day. It was then found its way into three Gospels, for instance. So obviously Matthew, Mark, and Luke all had heard it. And um, we see that there were other people. Um, in fact, we looked at one of those passages that says that many people were healed who touched Jesus, who reached through and touched him. How did they know to do that? Well, they probably heard the story of the woman with the issue of blood and said, okay, this is how you get healed from this Jesus guy. You sneak up on him. <laughs> Wait till he's not looking. <laughs> but it did work. Their faith was operative, and they did do something to receive their healing. So in any case, um, this is what we see here is that this man cries out to Jesus, and Jesus finally uh, doesn't hear him at first, and his friends try to discourage him uh, from continuing to cry out. He cries out all the more. He's not discouraged by what his friends say, and Jesus does hear him and calls him over. And so this man is able to receive his healing there. What action is Jesus de uh, describing his faith? Bartimaeus overcame, overcame the, uh, the crowd's discouragement to come to Jesus for help. Sometimes we see that people uh, have maybe family members, others around them that don't really believe, and they will get some discouragement from their family members about healing. Uh, and uh, but there are examples in the scripture of needing to overcome, you know, just needing to overcome that. And just, you know, um, my father, by the way, um, 
he grew up in a circumstance where he, um, in southern Texas where he saw ten re tent revivalists come through uh, the, from the Pentecostal movement uh, and uh, in the early 20s. And um, he said it was the best show in town. Uh, you just got to see some lively preaching, you know, lively singing. Um, he said, and then typically somebody would come out of a wheelchair. He said, the problem with it, Roger, is that you could go to the next town and see the same person out of the wheelchair. He said that it, it was clearly a setup uh, and people were doing it for money. And uh, so he didn't really get it when I started doing healing ministry. He, he just couldn't put it together. And it, it, it took him 10 years to really believe that what I was doing was legitimate. And it was actually video that he'd seen of people getting healed on stage as I prayed for them. In fact, I remember his first sincere question to me about it. Could this possibly be done by the power of suggestion, Roger? And I said, well, Dad, that's giving an awful lot of credit to the power of suggestion and no credit to the Bible whatsoever. <laughs> I said, you're a believer, so don't you think you ought to give the Bible some credit on this, that the Bible actually says that this is supposed to happen? He says, well, I guess. And it took him a long time to embrace um, the idea that his son uh, was actually doing this. But at, at near, his, near his death, the time of his death, he, uh, he was 83 years old. And he ended up in the hospital, and they couldn't diagnose anything particularly wrong with him. He just had grown weak and to the point where he would feel dizzy when he stood. And they did all sorts of uh, experiments, uh, testing on him to determine if what was wrong, but they never found anything. And so I got to spend the last month of his life with him. And he was introducing me as his son who gets people healed <laughs> to people in that hospital. And so he introduced me to a man who was, he had uh, developed a relationship with that was in the next room over who was dying. Um, they had not told my dad that he was dying, but they thought that that might have been happening. And uh, in any case, uh, they, uh, this man had uh, had some sort of open chest surgery and uh, he had developed a very severe infection in this wound. And they had treated him with all the antibiotics really known to man. They, every, they tried everything and his infection had just gotten worse. And they were telling him that he really needed to consider um, you know, planning for hospice care because he probably was not gonna survive this infection. And uh, so his, my father introduced me to him and um, said, as his son who is a minister who gets people healed, would you like him to pray for you? And so this man responded very favorably to this. Uh, Catholic background, um, what we call Cajun, Acadian, uh, French, uh, French in, from Louisiana. Um, and in any case, uh, um, he, uh, I shared the good news with him, uh, laid hands on him, prayed for with him, didn't know all the specifics of his situation other than the fact that he had a wound that was infected, was not healing. And uh, in any case, the next morning, he's very excited. Uh, during the night, his wound drained. Now, I didn't know that was a problem. Didn't pray specifically for his wound to drain. It's just God knows what he needs to happen. And uh, during that day, they determined that they could only find one little small spot of infection, that all the infection was gone. And so he was very excited. The next day, they couldn't even find that infection. So it was, and so he was going up and down the hallway in this, this hospital corridor and telling people that he had met a healer. <laughs> And I, I would remind him, I'd smile at him, I said, yes, his name is Jesus. <laughs> but he was referring to me because that was his concept of healing, you know. At one point, uh, when they told him that he was going to be released to go home and he wasn't going to die, at least not then, uh, he invited me into his room and bowed his head and said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> so I did. I blessed him. <laughs> he thought I was a Catholic priest, I guess, in some way. He was relating to me that way. So I blessed him and then had him pray with me to receive Christ as his savior. And so, while this uh, man was so enthusiastic, he, had, he, he stirred up the whole, the whole floor about it. And so I ended up praying with another couple that was on the other side of my father's room. And this woman in this case, um, I'm guessing 80s, uh, I'm not certain, but uh, she had full blown Alzheimer's and had something else that was uh, really making her sick. And, and they, they thought that she was not going to recover. She was going to die from that. And during that day, my father um, was anxious. They had given him steroids in order to prop him up, to, to stimulate him, seeing if that would help. And he, uh, it made him very anxious, and he was hallucinating. He, he said, Roger, do you see that line of ants going up the wall? I said, no, Dad, there's no ants. 
He says, you don't see any ants going across? And I said, no, there's no ants. He says, Roger, am I hallucinating? And I said, I think you are, Dan. And, uh, but it made him extremely anxious and shaky. And so uh, when I suggested that I was going to go talk to the people next door, he, it made him even feel more anxious. So I, I told them, I said, why don't you watch these DVDs? My father has to do some testing, and so I'm going to be, he's going to be away from me a, a while anyway. But I want to go with him to the testing, and I'll come back. And if uh, you feel still so inclined, I will, I will be glad to pray with your wife. And so they watched the DVDs, and the man came over and asked me to pray for her. And so I went over and prayed for her. And um, I don't really know what the condition was other than Alzheimer's, but uh, both of them had disappeared within the next few days. Um, and his, his wife got all her facilities back. And uh, he came over and he wept in my dad's room and told me that God had given him back his wife. And uh, so Alzheimer's is not any, any harder than anything else because Jesus is the one doing it. And so we just need to, you know, not put anything up on the top of the pyramid. He, you know, cancer is no harder than anything else. Strokes are no harder. All of these things are available to us because of what Jesus has done. What action is Jesus describing as faith? Well, uh, they overcame the crowd. Uh, they overcame whatever obstacle they had to come to Jesus for help. See, this is one of the things that nearly everyone has an obstacle to deal with in their thinking. Sometimes people feel ashamed. They have to overcome that. Sometimes they feel unworthy. Hey, join the unworthy club. You're not going to get healed because you're worthy. Everybody is unworthy and doesn't get healed because they're worthy. They get healed because Jesus was worthy. Everybody get this? You're greatly loved and you're greatly valued, but you're not worthy of receiving something. You got this? Only God is. You are greatly valued. You need to substitute the fact that you are valued than, than being worthy. You're not going to earn it from God. You, get, you might as well get that out of your head. It comes as a grace. It comes as a gift, not as a reward for labor, not as a reward for good works. You're not going to get it from God in that way. You're going to get it from him because of what Jesus has done. The Samaritan, one of ten lepers healed. Luke 17, verse 19, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. What action of the lepers caused them to be healed and to Christ to describe as his faith? They overcame any shame and came to Jesus. Remember, in that culture, having leprosy was considered a curse. So this would be a real moment of shame. In fact, they were required to, in the culture to cry out, unclean, 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 when they came into contact with healthy people. So you can imagine how much shame having leprosy, how it was attached to having leprosy. And uh, they had to overcome this and come near to Jesus, the scripture says, and Jesus wasn't afraid of them. That's, I always like that passage. They came near to him. And uh, this is a very interesting thing too. Here's a good place. If God wanted to demonstrate that God, his will was different for different people, the 10 lepers would be an ideal place to do it. Because then he could say, uh, you know, we can see Jesus doing triage. Okay, you three, I discern that it's God's will for you. The timing has come. You've learned your lesson. So it's God's will for you to be healed. And so, but you seven, boy, you still haven't learned your lesson. You know, uh, it's not God's timing. God still has a purpose in you remaining sick. And you guys just go away and come back. Come back in a few days. If, if your nose falls off in between, then you can come back now. Okay. You know, he didn't say that. He didn't do triage. He didn't say, okay, you know, some of you guys, it's God's will for you, others not. Jesus healed them all when they came. And that's what the disciples saw. That's what they would have known about healing. And what we encounter, which is the next hour that I'm going to share, uh, what we encounter is really most people who even believe in healing really do have a medieval view of it. They are thinking in terms of things that, the ideas that came into the church's experience during the dark ages. Uh, failures in healing described as a lack of faith. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. What was the difference in Nazareth and other places? They saw Jesus differently. One of the passages of scripture, I believe it's Mark's gospel, says, this, they said, this is the carpenter's son. We know his mother and brothers. What are they saying? He's a hometown boy. Who does he think he is? They responded to Jesus differently then the multitudes responded. The multitudes were saying, son of David. They were calling Jesus by a messianic title. 
son of David. They were thinking that he was Messiah. They were believing in him. Whereas here in his own hometown, they didn't believe and so they didn't come. It still was God's will for everyone in Nazareth to receive a healing. They just didn't come to receive. And so they didn't receive. Unbelief is from a Greek word that means no faith. Everybody say no faith. Some of you ate too much lunch. <laughs> what is Matthew describing as unbelief? They didn't come to Jesus. They didn't believe in him. The Greek word for faith is the Greek word pistos. If you put an alpha in front of it, it negates it. In fact, many, many words uh, are negated by an alpha. For instance, the Greek word um, that is a word for truth is aletheia. Uh, with an alpha in front of aletheia. And if you just take the portion that's not out the alpha, it really means hidden. So what does actually the word truth in Greek mean? Literally, it means unhidden. Uh, when, when you apply its literal meaning to places where the word truth is used, uh, the spirit of truth. Well, you could paraphrase that, the spirit that allows nothing to remain hidden. That's really what the, the Holy Spirit the ministry, that he allows nothing to remain hidden. The spirit of truth. Uh, so in any case, uh, if I use the word theos, that is the Greek word for God. If I put an alpha in front of it, what does it sound like? Atheos, what does that sound like to you? Yeah. What is atheism? Atheism means no God. It means the belief that there's no God. Uh, so uh, atheos really means no God, literally. So, so you see an alpha in front of this means that they didn't have any faith. They didn't do what the other people were doing. They didn't come to Jesus for faith, with faith, expecting something to happen. And also Jesus explains the disciples' failure to heal a, heal a boy. He starts out by saying, the littleness of your faith. And then he goes on to talk about that it doesn't come out, the spirit doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. Putting the two ideas together, what should prayer and fasting do for you? If done properly, they ought to strengthen your faith. If, if you do it for the purpose of discovering more about Jesus, they will strengthen your faith. You don't, by the way, fasting does not twist God's arm behind his back to get him to do things he's unwilling to do. If you think that that's what fasting is about, you've misunderstood. No, 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 no. God does not need a change of heart. He doesn't need a change of heart. We need a change of heart. And what fasting does is it changes us. It doesn't change God. It makes us a new vessel. When Jesus talks about fasting, he talks about putting new wine into old wineskins, putting a patch on them. He's basically saying that fasting makes us a new vessel. It changes our nature so that we can receive more of the grace of God. It makes us come in line with his purpose. It doesn't change his purpose to meld with ours. Everybody see that? It turns somebody and says, why don't you just confirm this? God doesn't need to change, you do. Tell you that to somebody. God doesn't need to change, you do. <laughs> God says, I change not. So whose gifts to change? <laughs> we do. That's what the word repent means, doesn't it? It means, okay, change your mind, change your direction, change what the way you're doing things, okay? We get to change, God doesn't need to. <laughs> All right. Near the top of page 10, the Galatians era. Uh, legalism. It adds requirements and conditions to simple faith in Jesus to be healed. Okay. Pretty much uh, most of us can kind of figure out what legalism is. We run into it all the time. However, um, what we'll see sometimes is expressed um, legalistic interpretation of events. For instance, you're sick and not healed because you're not. And you can list a long list of things. Not forgiving people not tithing, not renouncing the occult, not giving, praying, submitting, covering, attending church, breaking curses, and so on. The problem with that is that nobody in the multitude got healed. Jesus didn't suggest any of these things. They didn't get healed because they didn't come. They didn't receive healing because they didn't come expecting to be healed. That's the only reason they didn't receive. Okay? Not because they didn't, weren't doing the right things. It's a very important uh, draw. Uh, we receive the grace of God which changes us and enables us to do the right things. We don't do the right things so that we can receive grace. That's backwards. We receive grace so that we can do the right things. See, Old Covenant is 
You work hard to obey and God will bless you. New covenant is God will bless you so that you can obey. Big difference. It's based on Christ and not on us. It's based on his righteousness, not on us. Old Testament is based on our righteousness. New Testament is based on Christ's righteousness. And as a result, it's more stable. God blesses us, changes us, transforms us, blesses us, does all those things because of what Jesus has done, not because we're doing it. Very important to see that. Colossians error. Superstition. Everybody say superstition. Most people don't recognize that they have, they're superstitious in the church. Um, you know, the people who are superstitious think that they have advanced knowledge. Seriously. They think that they have revelation about things that you and I don't have. But what it is is that their superstition basically is out of control spirituality that does not measure itself by what Jesus taught. For instance, um, the cancer, oh, this, the third one down here, the cancer that I have is a reflection of disunity in my church. I had a pastor tell me this. Cancer I have is a reflection of disunity in my church. I'll be healed when there's unity in my church. So I looked at him and grinned. You can... If you smile, you can get away with a lot of things. And said, oh, so you're going to die, huh? And he laughed and said, uh, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I don't think you have any control over disunity in your church. And healing is not, thankfully, is not based on that. If healing was based on disunity in your church or sickness or getting healed was based on unity in your church, then, then we, we would, all of us have trouble because uh, you can't get people to do what you want them to do in that area. And uh, it's based on Christ. It's not based on unity. That's a very spiritual way to look at cancer. He's seeing that disunity in his body, the cancer he has in his body, is a, somehow a reflection of what's going on in his church. And if he fixes what's going on in his church, then he will have unity in his body, physical body. It's a very spiritual way of looking at cancer. It's just wrong. Because Jesus didn't teach us this. He didn't teach us that healing was based on unity. Can you imagine multitudes? In fact, we've had people, you know, think that, that they had to have unity in their marriage in order to get healed. Well, can you see Jesus doing that? Oh, he's going to do triage. Multitudes. Okay, listen up right now. Multitudes, I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying to you. Okay, all of you have really good marriages over here. <laughs> and all of you who are really having struggle over here, we're going to get the people who have good marriages healed first. And then we're going to do marriage counseling for you guys to see if you can qualify for healing. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't build it on the basis of unity and marriage or anything else? But that, those ideas are in people's heads. They're, they're seeing something in a spiritual way that's really not there. I'm bearing the sicknesses of someone else. This was very common back a few years ago. I ran into it in lots of different churches. It was primarily women who felt called to being intercessors. And uh, they, they, were, they were taught that they would bear the sicknesses of other people at different times. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. It teaches Jesus bore the sickness. So occasionally I'd run into a woman. I remember one case. I ran into this woman who said to me that she was bearing the cancer of a pastor across town. Sounds like a very noble thing to do. So I said, uh, I said uh, so you have cancer? And she said, oh, yes. I said, and he has cancer. Yes. I said, how's he doing? She got quiet and she says, well, he's still pretty sick. I said, so it's not working. And I said, I've got some good news for you. You don't have to bear his cancer because Jesus has already done that. And I've got good news for him. You can tell him this, that Jesus has borne his cancer. He doesn't have to continue to be sick. He can receive a healing. See, lots of times people will buy into things that prevent them from receiving a healing. Occasionally, someone says to me something like this. They say, Roger, I have a blockage. I just can't receive my healing. And I say, okay, tell me what the blockage is. Well, I don't know. I said, well, I know what it is. It's the idea that you have a blockage. Your blockage is the idea that you've accepted that you have a blockage. Because the moment you accept the idea that you have a blockage, you're no longer believing. You see the point? The idea has prevented her from receiving 
because she now thinks she can't receive because of what Jesus, because it will somehow or another doesn't apply to her. She's this special exception. By the way, if I go to a church and they have not heard me preach and teach on healing, uh, the first thing I like to do in those churches is say, okay, how many of you feel like everybody else can receive a healing, but you just can't? Three quarters of the hands will go up. Three quarters in most churches. Now, what is that? That is doubt working. Doubt is a phenomenon of the medieval period that was passed on to the western side of the church. The eastern side of the church doesn't have this problem, but we do. And so let's just move on to that section five. You can read this business about forgiving others. Forgiving others is important, but is not a prerequisite to getting healed. Otherwise, we couldn't get witches healed and Satanists and a variety of other people. Section five. How are we doing on time? What, this session of... We got, we've just done an hour so far? Okay, good. All right. Section five, medieval model creates doubt. All right, now let me give you a quick overview of the, a uh, little bit of the history of the church. Up until about the third century, fourth century rather, uh, 313 AD is when the church became, um, what should I say, in institutionalized in the Roman Empire. Um, 313 AD, Constantine declared the empire Christian. So it became politically correct to be a Christian. Up until that time, persecutions had happened periodically. Um, the, it was not easy to be a Christian. In some cases, you lost your property. Other situations, people in your family might have died. There was uh, ongoing problems with traitors in the church who turned people in. Um, it was a difficult time to be a Christian through that period of time. And yet, at the same time, Christianity spread like wildfire through the, through the empire. People came to know Jesus as their savior, people were willing to give up their lives because of Jesus. They were martyred in the Colosseum as Christians, sometimes burned, sometimes given to lions or bears. And the more, they say, the more people that died in the Colosseum for Jesus, that there was every time that someone died in the Colosseum for Christ and did it with great courage, that there were 10 conversions in the, in the audience that saw it, that people who received Christ. The, the gospel was so widespread, people knew what was happening to those people and knew what they believed. And healing was very available during the period of the early church. Just about everybody could do it. Average thing, ordinary Christians ministered healing successfully. And, uh, but when the church became institutionalized by the third, by three centuries into this, about the sixth century, we started seeing uh, it pretty much disappear from the church. Uh, and only very special people seemed to be able to do it who were often persecuted, interestingly enough, by they were persecuted in their lifetime and only to made a, be made a saint a hundred years later. <laughs> and, and so there were people like St. Francis of Assisi and so on, but it was no longer an ordinary experience of Christians to receive, to both minister healing and to, to receive a healing. This went on until the Reformation period, which is a thousand years. There were a thousand years during this period of time when the church really lost touch with what Jesus taught. It was called the Dark Ages, the medieval period. And a thousand years went on in that period of time. And people during the medieval period simply did not know what Jesus taught. The, there was a lot of superstition in the church, a lot of uh, money-making uh, ventures. During that period of time, the Reformation came in reaction to many of the things that were abusive. And, uh, but the Reformers did not believe in healing either. In fact, they thought healing might be a Catholic superstition. And so they rejected the idea that God was still healing the sick. The American shores were settled by Protestants, uh, primarily uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, what we saw was people who were being persecuted in Europe came to the United States and most of them were Protestants who did not believe in healing. And only until about the 19th century, or the turn of the 20th century I should say, what we saw is that the Pentecostal movement began to bring back some of the experiences of healing, although they were still very confused and mixed a lot of medieval theology. It's only been in the last 15 years or so that the church is being able to sort out what Jesus taught from what the medieval period actually brought to us. Many people that we encounter who theoretically believe in healing, including myself, were more exposed to medieval ways of thinking about healing than they were to, to what Jesus taught. 
In fact, I, I was very schooled in those ways of thinking about things, and that's what caused me to not really be able to pray in faith in many ways. So, let me, doubt is the major problem that comes to us as Christians from the medieval period. Doubt is a Greek word that is, uh, the, word, the Greek word behind doubt is most often translated as the, as the English word judge. It's very frequent in scripture, but occasionally it's, tra- it's, it's properly tra- translated as doubt. If you could use the word discrimination uh, to get the idea, or disqualify would work for the idea of doubt. Um, doubt is, for, for instance, I say doubt is discrimination against yourself or someone else. Uh, here's, the, here's the way it worked for me. Uh, when I would pray for someone, if it didn't start happening pretty quick, then I would disqualify myself by the fact that I didn't feel very spiritual that day. Or I might disqualify the person I was praying for uh, if I knew some things about them. And because I had theology that matched my discrimination, I would say to myself, maybe God is trying to bring them home if they had a little gray hair. Or maybe God is trying to teach them something if I didn't really like them very much. Um, you know, whatever, in other words, I had theology that had matched my experience of not getting people healed. Had reasons to think that God somehow or another wasn't willing to do these things. So, in any case, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about how doubt works. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31, we have the story of Peter walking on the water. In that circumstance, Peter... Um, uh, is in the boat with the other disciples. It's late at night. There's a storm that hits, and uh, uh, the p- disciples are frightened at what they're seeing. If you, you have to put all the stories together to get all the details. And, uh, but Peter has a different reaction to what's happening. He says, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come out in the water. The Lord says, come. Peter takes a step out of the boat. He begins to successfully walk on water. He's actually doing it. And that's quite a step out of the boat. How many of you have seen Bruce Almighty? All right, good. The rest of you need to see that movie. (laughs) It's really got a good point. It's a comedy, and it's a little risque at points, but um, it's uh, it's got a very good point about it, a very good theological point. Uh, It's a very serious point uh, through the whole movie. You know, he gets the power of God, and uh, and, God won't allow him to do one thing, and that's to force people to love him so he can't get his girlfriend to love him. He, does, he has the power of God, and yet uh, he, he can't do that. And that's really true of God, too. He has limited himself. He, not, he has chosen not to make us robots. We, get, we do have true significance that we can choose to love God or choose not to. And it's really amazing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point in the movie. But there's a moment in that movie where, where Bruce is tiptoeing on the water. Do you remember that scene? And, uh, but this is not the same thing. You know, that movie gives you a miss gives you a funny idea about what actually happened here. This is a storm. This is waves going up and down. And Peter takes a step out of the boat. That's quite a step. That's an amazing step, if you think about it. The other, can you imagine Peter turning to the other disciples and saying, do you think I ought to do this, guys? You th- if he had a committee meeting, do you think that they would have agreed with him that he should have done that? No, they would have probably said, Peter, you're being proud. You know, you, you're doing it again, Peter. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing things and you're trying to be different than the rest of us, you know. But Peter actually was the only one that you could ask today, what's the secret of walking on water? You know what Peter would say to you? Keep your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> because what happened was he got distracted while he was out there. The scripture says, seeing the wind and the waves, Peter began to sink. He took his eyes off Jesus, began to sink, and... Um, he cries out to the Lord for help, and the Lord grabs him by the hand, pulls him back on the water, and says these words to him. O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Greek word here, again, translated most often as the word judge. Why did you judge yourself outside the grace of God? Why did you discriminate in this circumstance against yourself? I, what, was it God's will for Peter to walk on water? Yeah, Jesus said, come. He was successfully doing it at first. What happened here? Jesus is pointing out the problem. Doubt occurred. Now, we don't know what Peter thought about, why, how this affected him, and so, but I could speculate. He might have said, 
he might have said to himself, whoops, what am I doing out here? Jesus can do these things, but I am an unrighteous man. You know, I don't qualify. Or he might have said, what will the other disciples think? Disqualifying himself. Or he might have said, um, well, any number of things, you know, just to speculate on what was going on there. But something occurred to him as he was out there on the water that said to him, you shouldn't be doing this. And as a result, he agreed with that, and the power of God disappeared. The power of God was present to do this miracle to the moment he disqualified himself. Do you get this? We see this in healing. TD's experienced it. I've experienced it. I bet Helen has experienced it too. When I'm praying for someone, and all of a sudden, the power of God just disappears. Something is happening for them, but all of a sudden, it just completely just is gone. And uh, I've often said to the people, I said, now, did you just think of something, did something just come across your mind that disqualified you in your thinking from healing? I remember the last time I said that to someone. You know what they said to me? Well, there's so many other people here whose need is greater than mine. What do they do? They say, what you're doing for me, Jesus, is not important. They disqualify themselves. You get this? Instead of saying, Jesus, so thank you for what you're doing for me, instead, another idea came in their head and said, oh, you know, that's more important over there. Now, that sounds noble, but that disqualifies you. By the way, there's plenty of healing for everyone. And we, we'll stick with it. We were here till after 11 last night, weren't we? I don't mind that at all. If I'm here, I'm, I'm here. I don't have any place else to go. <laughs> So we, you know, we'll stick with it if you will. But don't disqualify yourself. Your healing is just as important as someone else's, even if their situation is very serious. It's very important for you to receive in things that are not so serious too, because then when you face something that's serious, you'll be ready for it. You'll say, God help me with the lion, God help me with the bear, he'll help me with this Philistine. You'll be able to do what David did and said, I known God's faithfulness. He's healed me of this thing, and he's healed me of that thing, and I can receive in the future. The second circumstance here, her cursing the fig tree. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. And what has happened here, Jesus and his disciples have gone one from one place to another. Uh, Jesus encounters a fig tree uh, as they travel from one village to another, and uh, there's no figs on the fig tree. Uh, it's just out of season for figs, nothing particularly wrong with the fig tree, but it says that Jesus says these words. He says, no man shall eat figs from you again. And he goes on to the village to do ministry, comes back um, uh, and to this situation, and the fig tree has withered from the roots up. In other words, it died when Jesus said the words. It just wasn't apparent to the eye that it, something had happened. Oftentimes in the area of healing, um, we have to teach people not to let go um, immediately after we pray for them, but hold on. And we, we teach people who are praying to do that too because many things can transpire out of our sight. Uh, I prayed for a, a man who had a spinal cord injury um, in Canada and um, I felt something happen when I prayed for him. Uh, he didn't feel anything, but uh, he's in the car headed home and I'm, I still, I hold on to things a long time before I let go of them, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, he's two hours after the meeting, uh, he starts feeling his legs. And by the time that they get home, he starts moving his legs. And I don't know what's happened since then, but he was already obviously starting to receive a healing. That happened two hours after I prayed for him with no evidence in his experience that it actually was changing. You've got to hold on. As Jesus continues healing people, even if you're done, done praying. Is that true? Yeah, he continues to work with people. It's not, it's not just our prayers. It's coming in contact with Christ. And sometimes people can stay in contact with Christ for some time uh, after the... I'll tell you a story, and then are we coming close to the time where we need to take another break, brother? Yeah, okay. A quick story here. I was ministering in a church, and they had three small churches had come together, but it ended up with quite a few people to pray for. And uh, this, these uh, churches were not real familiar with uh, healing ministry, and the pastors weren't either. And so I didn't really have a lot of help in those circumstances. Today, I, I bring help along. <laughs> 
and uh, didn't have a lot of help to pray for people in that circumstance and ended up with about 600 people to pray for in a short amount of time. So I said to the folks, listen, I can't pray for you in the normal way that I would do, which would be interview you, find out what's wrong, uh, lay hands on you and pray deliberately for that particular condition. I just can't do that with this many people. So what I'm going to do, I still believe on laying on hands, so what I'm going to do is that you just come forward and you point to where you want me to put my hands and I'll pray and you agree with me in prayer and then if you receive a healing, I believe you will, if you receive a healing, go over and testify to it over there at the microphone. And so that seemed to be working. Uh, we were moving through the crowd pretty fast and getting some testimonies happening. Even though I wasn't testing everything, people were testing afterward. Anyway, there's a man in a wheelchair. Um, and I'm not afraid of wheelchairs because people are in wheelchairs for a variety of reasons. But in any case, I lay hands on this man. His wife is there. She points, she says, tells me to put my hands on her head, his head. So I do put my hands on his head. Don't know what's wrong with him. But immediately he stands up. Now, uh, if she hadn't have said, uh, you know, he couldn't do that, I wouldn't have known that. Um, uh, you know, because people sometimes in wheelchairs are just weak. You know, they can stand and that sort of thing. But she says, he couldn't do that. I said, well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you walk with him? So she begins to walk with him. And I go back to praying for people. I just go back to looking to the Lord with them. And, and, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, they're walking around the edge of it. And she, this is probably five minutes after I prayed for her. And she says, he's hearing. I said, he was deaf? <laughs> yes, he was completely deaf. I said, well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, hallelujah. Cool. <laughs> Uh, in any case, they continue walking up on the edge of the thing, and about 10 minutes into this thing, she, I'm still praying for somebody else. Uh, she yells at me, he's speaking. I said, he was mute? She said, yes, completely. The bottom line was, is this guy started getting healed of this condition that I had no knowledge of. It's Jesus is doing the healing, not us. You know, he knew what what this guy needed. I don't need, I don't know. I don't really even need to know all the specifics. I do that so that I can pray with knowledge, but the bottom line is that Jesus knows what's wrong with people. He, lots of times we have the experience of praying for someone and they get healed with something we knew, know nothing about. It comes as part of the package. They get a, get a comprehensive healing. They present one thing and they get more than that uh, because God knows what they need. That's good news, isn't it? That's right. In any case, uh, cursing the fig tree here, uh, Jesus tells them that they can do small miracles like the fig tree uh, or larger miracles by dealing with doubt. This is Matthew chapter 21, verse 21. If you have faith and do not doubt, you shall not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it shall happen. This is Jesus' explanation to his disciples when they're so surprised at this miracle. He says this, he says, not only can you do things like this, but you can do greater things like moving a mountain into the sea. But you have to believe and not doubt. Not disqualify yourself. See, the church in the Western world has been taught to do that. We think that the minister is the guy who gets to do all the stuff. So we disqualify ourselves. We, and there's a variety of other ways that we disqualify. We don't think of ourselves as anointed or gifted. We just start disqualifying ourselves in various different ways. And here Jesus says, if you believe, you qualify for there. And don't disqualify yourself. Okay. Then you can do things like this. Peter, at the temple gate, obviously was qualifying himself, wasn't he? He said, silver and gold have I none, but such that I have, I give to you. He qualified himself in that circumstance that he knew he had to give. And therefore, the, this man was healed in that circumstance. Need to qualify. Turn to somebody and say you're a rascal, but you're a qualified rascal. <laughs> 